Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, this is Paku Khan with Ketan & Co. Uh, we're delighted to be presenting this uh, uh, webinar on um, arbitration. So let me turn it over to Amy Haryani at the U.S. India Business Council. Thanks, Paku. Good morning to those of you joining us on the West Coast. Uh, good afternoon if you're joining us on the East Coast in the United States. And good evening, good very late evening if you're joining us from India. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us for this program. I'm so pleased that the U.S. India Business Council has partnered with Ketan & Co., as well as the South Asian Bar Association, D.C. chapter, uh, for this really excellent discussion we're about to have on arbitration and alternative dispute resolution in the U.S.-India corridor. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Amy Haryani, and I'm Vice President and Legal Policy Counsel at the U.S.-India Business Council. We're a bilateral trade organization promoting U.S.-India business ties um, in both the U.S. and in India. And uh, I'm so pleased today to be able to have this discussion because as we advise our businesses, either as they enter into the market into India, expand, or for our Indian companies entering the US market or expanding here, ADR and um, litigation are always issues that come up. In particular, we hear from it as they enter the market, as they think about um, you know, partnering with a new supplier, uh, setting up a new uh, subsidiary, you know, what sort of mechanisms do I have if something goes wrong? And ADR is always at the forefront of those conversations. So we're going to hear today from two real pre preeminent experts on this issue um, to help think through what options um, companies have. If you're a lawyer in a law firm, what you should be thinking about as you advise your clients, as well as some of the alternative options that you may have. Um, and let me just say for everyone's knowledge that we are recording today's program and we are going to be uh, amplifying it out on social media. So um, we will get to a place where, um, you know, you can put questions in the chat box or follow up with the speakers, but just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording. Um, so with that, again, I want to thank Ketan and Saba DC for partnering with us. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Paku to introduce our two speakers and kick off the program today. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you to the U.S. India Business Council and the South Asian Bar Association, D.C., for sponsoring this event. And we want to wish our audience an extremely warm welcome. And as Amy said, it spans the basically the entire United States, as well as uh, the EU and the U.K., as well as uh, India and Singapore. So we've got uh, people from all over joining us. First and foremost, uh, we hope that all of you are staying safe and healthy during these trying times. And as Amy noted, um, we're going to talk today about uh, alternative dispute resolution or ADR. And personally speaking, I'm really happy to have the chance to moderate this program today. Um, I've been a lawyer for over 30 years and I've worked as a lawyer or a legal consultant in the United States, the European Union, and in India. And resolving disputes has always been a key passion of mine. Um, I'm a certified mediator myself, as well as former in house counsel. And I think um, from both Shukla and Vanita, our two speakers today, we're going to hear about that being the key is dispute resolution allows businesses to keep on keeping on with their business. So we're going to be covering a large amount of information today, and we're going to take about 50 minutes or so um, of the total one hour program to talk uh, and have a panel discussion between uh, Shukla and Vanita. And then we'll take about 10 minutes for questions from our audience. Um, at the end. So we've, we're going to go for a full 60 minutes and we'll try to end at the 60th minute. And uh, before we begin, let me uh, explain a few basic operational rules for the webinar. Um, if you're hearing us now and see our panelists and the slides on your screen, that means you're properly connected to the webinar. Uh, second, the speakers on your computer or phones are on, but your microphones and cameras are off. So you can hear and see us, but we can't see or hear you. And third, um, as Amy said, we're going to take questions. So feel free to use the question um, feature in your GoTo webinar control panel at any time during the day. We've already gotten some advanced questions. And for those of you who are going to watch the recording of this, um, we have an email uh, set up where you can email questions, and uh, Vanita and Shukla uh, will try to answer them at the end. Um, and finally, a few days from now, we'll send you the slides and a recording of the webinar. So taking a look at uh, the slide before you now, let me just quickly introduce uh, the two featured speakers. First of all, we have my partner, Vanita Bhargava, 
uh, from Kethan & Co. She's a dispute resolution partner based in our New Delhi office. Uh, she's a senior member of the team uh, there and she's an advocate of record in the uh, Supreme Court of India. She has almost 25 years of experience in a variety of matters, including both domestic Indian arbitration and international arbitration um, relating to constitutional law, tax law, environmental law, civil laws, corporate laws, et cetera. Um, so she is um, also, in addition to being an arbitrator herself, uh, her practice includes uh, work before the Supreme Court, the high courts, the National Green Tribunal, the Mining Tribunal, the National Company Law Tribunal, and Quasi-Judicial Tribunal. So um, I've worked with uh, Vanita for nearly a decade, and it's a pleasure to be having uh, this conversation with her. And uh, the uh, next person is also a dear friend of mine, Shukla Wasson. Um, she's a fellow uh, member of the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. Um, she was uh, previously the chief legal counsel or legal advisor for major multinational corporations, Indian operations, such as Hindustan, Coca-Cola, Beverages Private Limited, Xerox India Limited, Record Ben Kaiser Limited. And her wide ranging experience includes joint ventures, refranchising, strategic alliances, intellectual property, indirect tax, competition law, and especially arbitration, mediation, conciliation, and uh, corporate governance. She's also served on the board of directors uh, for various boards for a decade and is pres presently an independent director in listed companies in India and chairperson of listed entities in Nepal. Um, she's a recipient of the uh, Corporate Council of India's Excellence Award 2019 in the food and beverage sector, Corporate Lawyer of the Year by the Annual Women in Compliance Awards and a whole host of awards. And we're delighted, Shukla, for you to join us today to give us the perspective of uh, in-house counsel. And as for myself, uh, I'm Paku Khan. I'm an executive director at Kethan & Com. Uh, I used to live in India, but I'm actually coming at you from the San Francisco Bay Area. And as I said, uh, alternative dispute resolution is uh, something that's uh, near and dear to our heart. And Shukla and Vanita today is going to give us some practical guidance on, on how it works in practice and some tips to, to consider as you move forward on considering ADR. Just turning to the next slide uh, very quickly, what we're going to do in this sequence is take about uh, 10 minutes or so to talk about the uh, ADR landscape in India today and challenges in the Indian context. And uh, both uh, Vanita and Shukla will uh, guide us on those two topics, one and two. Then we're going to have a panel discussion where I'll ask some questions that we've selected. And rather than a boring lecture um, with slides, we thought it would be much better to have a conversation among friends as to ADR and the realities of it, the practicalities, where it is today and where it's going uh, tomorrow. Um, and I think that will be interesting. So that'll take us to about 45 minutes of the program. We'll spend about 10 minutes on your questions as they come through and then we'll close. So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Vanita. Thank you, Paku and Amy. Uh, good evening, Shuta. Good morning to all in the US and good evening to our audience in India. I'm delighted at this opportunity to highlight the positives of the arbitration landscape in India today, which has come a far way from 1996, when after opening of the Indian economy, the government of India to facilitate arbitration, uh, enacted the Arbitration and Conciliation Act 1996, which consolidated and amended the different laws to India's economic needs. However, there were certain key factors that prevented India from becoming the arbitration hub or the preferred destination, like lack of institutional arbitration, high costs of arbitration, delays in proceedings, judicial intervention leading to delays and uncertainty, automatic stay of award on filing of objections leading to delay, delay in enforcement, no provision to enforce any interim order passed by the tribunal, lack of dedicated benches to hear arbitration matters, and the circumstances which give rise to justifiable doubts to neutral, neutrality of arbitrators were not defined. Since effective arbitration process can make India a sought after business destination and enhance ease of business, some of the uh, sorry, some of the uh, these issues have been sought to be addressed uh, in the last uh, five years, commencing from amendments made in the 1996 Act in 2015, 
and then in 2019 to boost investor confidence uh, make india arbitration friendly and encourage arbitral institutions as opposed to ad hoc arbitration the arbitration act amendment bill 2021 uh, which is enforced by way of an ordinance since 4th november 2020 was passed in the lower house of parliament and is awaiting approval of the upper house these frequent amendments itself speaks about the government's keenness to develop the arbitration regime in india and willingness to deal with prevalent issues and adopt necessary changes some of the positives of the adr landscape in india today uh, are that one there is an ease in enforcement of awards uh, there is no automatic stay of the enforcement of award upon a party filing objection to the award uh, one of the reasons of uh, refusal of for an award was if the award was contrary to the public policy of india this was clarified by the 2015 amendment and given a specific meaning uh, in 2015 commercial courts have also been constituted in the high courts and district courts to deal with commercial disputes including enforcement of awards to improve efficiency and reduce delays there is no scope for an appeal against an order of the court for the enforcement of a foreign award only an appeal against an order refusing to enforce a foreign award is provided for uh, as per the 2015 amendment interim awards can also now be enforced as decree of a court there is reduced judicial intervention and finality of awards is respected uh, there is an increased trend by the courts to reduce judicial intervention and the amendments have also brought out a regime of minimal judicial intervention even prior to amendment section 5 provided that no judicial authority shall intervene except where provided under the act uh, amendments have been made in uh, sections 8 9 and 11 to reduce intervention of courts uh, courts can at best look into the validity of existence of an arbitration agreement only if an action is brought before a judicial authority in spite of there being an arbitration clause under section 8 courts will not consider an application for grant of interim relief if arbitral tribunal is constituted under section 9 uh, objections to the award are also restricted to certain grounds and is in consonance with article 34 of the uncitral model law appealable orders uh, are also restricted to specific circumstances which reduces uh, judicial intervention uh, in principle the court does not sit as a court of appeal over the award and would not reappreciate or reassess evidence uh, the prospective effect to the 2015 amendment sought to be given a uh, wide 2019 amendment has been also struck down by the supreme court uh, there are provisions to facilitate expedited proceedings uh, the 2015 amendment provides for a time-bound appointment of arbitral tribunal a mandate of an arbitrator can be terminated if he fails to act without undue delay a uh, time-bound completion of pleadings is provided for uh, to disincentivize delay a regime of costs has been introduced uh, section 29a introduced under the 2015 amendment provides for time limit of 12 months to pass arbitral award from the time the arbitrator enters reference which was amended in 2019 from the time of completion of pleadings uh, by the 2019 amendment this was restricted only to domestic awards considering the complexities that arise in international commercial arbitrations uh, the 2015 amendment also introduced a fast track procedure subject to agreement of parties uh, the commercial courts act 2015 also provides for expedited disposal and is restricted appeals only against certain orders uh, there is procedural flexibility uh, the civil procedure code and the evidence act do not apply to arbitration proceedings and the parties are free to agree on a procedure to appoint an arbitrator conduct of arbitral proceedings procedure to challenge an arbitrator language choose the applicability of foreign institutional arbitration etc parties can even provide for qualification of an arbitrator which courts will regard while appointing an arbitrator the parties by agreement or the arbitrator may seek evidence of expert witnesses now apart from the above amendments have also been brought about to rationalize the arbitrator's fees so far as domestic award is concerned However, the same does not apply to international commercial arbitration and where parties have agreed to determination of peace as per the rules of an arbitral institution. Uh, further provisions have been introduced to ensure independence and impartiality of arbitrators. Uh, mandatory disclosures have been put into place to secure appointment of independent and impartial arbitrator. Uh, in case of appointment of sole or third arbitrator in international commercial arbitrations, a supreme court or high court may appoint an arbitrator of a nationality other than nationalities of parties where nationalities are different the circumstances or grounds which give rise to doubt and impartiality have now been specified under the amended act though not notified the 2019 amendment also now seeks to promote institutional arbitration as opposed to ad hoc arbitration 
and empowers the central government to establish the Arbitration Council of India, uh, entrusted with grading of arbitral institutions on the basis of different criteria relating to infrastructure, quality, and caliber of arbitrators, etc. Uh, Further, other modes of alternate dispute resolution like uh, mediation and conciliation are also being encouraged given the growing burden of uh, pending cases. The judiciary has passed many landmark pro-arbitration judgments clarifying many of the issues. Uh, there is an endeavor to increase World Bank ranking in ease of doing business and steps are being taken to achieve the same. India ranked at 131 out of 189 countries in 2016 World Bank ranking for ease of doing business. According to 2019 rankings, India has gained 63rd rank out of 190 countries. May I request uh, for the next slide? Oh. On the other hand, uh, India has a very low ranking in enforcement of contracts, that is 163. While it may have improved in comparison to before, it is still very low. Uh, therefore, there are challenges that still remain. Uh, India will not have a robust domestic arbitration environment unless institutional arbitration becomes the norm. This can only be done if arbitration agreements mention the specific institution that will conduct arbitral proceedings. Pendency in the courts today is a serious concern. This delays arbitration proceedings as well. Uh, the training of arbitrators, especially for those not having any judicial background, is needed so that the awards passed by them can withstand judicial scrutiny. Uh, the provisions regarding completion of pleadings in six months overlook the complexities uh, in international ar commercial arbitrations. Further, this may pose a difficulty where parties want to bifurcate issues or amend the claim or counterclaim. Uh, in international arbitrations, the arbitrators routinely hold a case management hearing and after consultation with the parties, issue an order on the procedural timetable for completion of pleadings, conduct of hearings, etc. This could have been adopted. Uh, the amended act provides for maintaining confidentiality. Uh, the ICC rules of arbitration along with the publication of award uh, provides for an opt-out procedure by which any party may at any time object to publication of an award or request that the award be sanitized or redacted. Uh, there is a lack of opt-out procedure in India. Further, adequate exceptions to obligation of confidentiality are not provided. For example, where a party files for anti-arbitration injunction before civil court or initiates criminal proceedings, etc. Uh, parties tend to incorporate the traditional elements of the courts in the arbitration process, as do the arbitrators. Uh, for example, in several countries uh, during arbitration, the parties only rely on written submissions made to the arbitrator for resolution of disputes. But in India, oral arguments along with written submissions are still a preferred choice of representation. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, Shukla, over to you. Thank you, Vinita. Uh, and good morning to uh, paku and to amy and to friends in the us and good evening to friends in india uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you my experience as a general counsel in the adoption of the alternate dispute resolution it Rita has said it a number of times it is an admitted fact that there is enormous delay in getting justice from courts in india this has been a big concern for corporate houses corporate counsel's role has emerged from being a legal advisor to a business facilitator and a partner and also share accountability for business performance. Hence, the councils are always exploring and adopting alternate dispute uh, resolution mechanism, be it in a formal structured manner such as arbitration or through a facilitative mode of mediation and conciliation. In India, generally, if both the parties are local, they adopt Indian Arbitration and Conciliation Act with India as a seat of arbitration. Only in exceptional circumstances, they may incorporate LCI, that's London uh, Arbitration Center, as or SIAC with London or Singapore as their seat of arbitration. These are when, primarily when they have the shareholder agreement dispute or if they have a joint venture agreement, that's when these Indian parties prefer to have them. Most contracts where one party is an international company, they adopt the same, the LCIA and the SIAC or similar institution. This is primarily due to the reason that the institutional arbitration in India is still at its nascent stage and is yet to develop itself to a similar status. Although the government of India is taking all steps towards making India as the next arbitration hub, in routine or low value contracts, there's seldom any specific reference to arbitration or mediation as these disputes are resolved, disputes are generally resolved amicably, and if not, then they're litigated. 
However, for contracts with large value, which particularly your turnkey projects or construction, heavy engineering industry, IT or software, etc., there's generally an arbitration as well as a mediation uh, and a conciliation clause. Triad approach, uh, tiered approach is, all, is often included in these contracts. Arbitration proceedings have come under some criticism owing to high cost and time and enforceability of award. My co-panelist Vinita has already addressed the issue of enforceability of these awards in India and that it may not be a concern. However, international uh, um, commercial uh, arbitration has concerns with regard to timelines and the cost which is, which is mounting day or over day. In India, mediation and conciliation are another ADR uh, avenues which are being uh, explored, which are being adopted in India. These are these words are interchangeably used and is fast gaining momentum in resolution of impasse between two commercial dispute between two parties, uh, commercial dispute. So to encourage mediation as an ADR, few courts in India have set up mediation centers and the honorable judges are referring matters to these mediation centers for uh, resolution. The government of India in its attempt to speed up ease of doing business in India have incorporated mediation in some of the legislation and is currently in the process of drafting the mediation rules. They have set up the Lok Adalat under the Legal Services Authority Act, encouraging parties to settle the dispute amicably before the local uh, Adalat. It's very encouraging that recently the Mumbai High Court has held that you know if an order is if a settlement is achieved uh, and uh, before the Lok Adalat then the fee paid, the court fee paid, 100% of the court fee paid will be refunded to the petitioner. The Commercial Court Act 2015, which was amended in 2018, provides a mandatory mediation, mediation for all disputes on, monet, on monetary value of the case. And they have been spread out. So I'm happy to share that. Uh, and being the, the relevance of uh, ADR, particularly mediation and conciliation, in corporate would i would like to, in that connection i would like to share an instance where we achieved a successful thing this was a land dispute that we had and um, this the plant was in operation for maybe another uh, for about 20 25 years and the property was titled the title of the dog property was well registered and everything there's no dispute whatsoever suddenly out of the blue we got a claim saying that the title when when acquired was defective and that led to the new uh, buyer, the new owner of the land, setting uh, filing cases across. He's filed the cases before the local court, the state court, the high court, everywhere possibly. And they, there was a stage when they came to almost uh, break down one wing of the uh, plant operation. So we had a lot of uh, litigation with that. And we had to move the chief justice's house court. We had to move the Supreme Court as well. So on and all, we had 13 cases between both of us fighting it before the court of law. But we realized that this can go endlessly. There's no, there will never be a resolution. And then our business continuity is a fact. As I said, GCs are accountable to make sure that business continuity is there at all point in time. You know, so we then got into a conciliatory mode. We got across the table. We just dis we discussed, negotiated, and finally went into a settlement. And then all of the 13 contracts was uh, withdrawn because the basis on the settlement. And we filed the same before the Supreme Court. So ADR, if it's done in the right form, the right manner, it definitely is a success story for India because litigation is not always the resolution for this. As, is, as it's been repeatedly said that, you know, many major concern of arbitration are high cost and it is time consuming. And in case mediation, the enforceability of the settlement uh, in India. Arbitration today, arbitrators today are encouraging parties to the dispute to settle their matter amicably if it is possible, if there are scope to do so. So if the parties are able, in such a case, if the parties are able to settle the dispute, then the settlement agreement entered between the party is recorded in the arbitral award, thereby giving it the much needed enforceability and also an amicable resolution to the whole thing. This has also been provided in the Indian Arbitration Section 30 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. COVID-19 and the lockdown with almost no travel in 2020 and restricted travel in 2021 have encouraged the development of online dispute resolution process, both in mediation as well as arbitration. This has been an, a boon to the alternate dispute resolution process. Owing to the ODR platform, arbitrators and mediators have become more agile and have adopted the ODR process. This has resulted in saving on travel time and costs and other resources and also expeditious resolution of disputes 
as a corporate counsel time cost and relationship with being the essence in the corporate world litigation should generally be the last resort the adr particularly with the development of the odr product is there to stay and will continue to grow in times to come and um, i'm happy to have shared this with, with uh, my experience on adr and uh, mediation as adr uh, in my capacity as a general counsel and i'd like to now give it to hand it over to paku uh shukla Vinita, thank you very much for giving us the lay of the land uh, both in terms of some of the high-level thoughts on, on the legal and regulatory environment on ADR in India, as well as Shukla's perspective from being a general counsel and how these uh, matters play out. So we're going to turn in a second to um, some questions that I've got for both Vanita and Shukla. Uh, but before I do that, let me just remind the audience to please uh, send us any questions using the uh, webinar platform under the questions box. And for those watching the recording, uh, we'll give you an email address where you can send us the information um, that you need uh, uh, guidance on. So Shukla and Vanita, let's get to some of the questions I've got. And one of the things um, I admire both of you for is being practical and giving reasonable solutions. Um, you both indicated that uh, arbitration and ADR still has a ways to go in India, but it's still a very important uh, tool to resolve problems between companies and entities. So, Vanita, let me ask you the first question, and let's start from the beginning of the relationship uh, when you're drafting contracts uh, of any sort. Um, what kind of ADR clauses do you suggest? What are some of the key facets of those? Thanks, Paco. Uh, so, uh, a clearly uh, drafted and unambiguous arbitration agreement is definitely important for prevention of multiple litigious issues which may arise and uh, lead to delay in adjudication of disputes. Uh, so, as Shukla said, in many arbitration agreements, uh, multi-tiered clauses set out a sequence for invoking the arbitration agreement and provide for pre-arbitration procedure. So, parties may first provide uh, for an informal amicable resolution through a time-bound mutual discussion, failing which parties can provide that parties must mandatorily utilize a mediation to try and settle the dispute prior to any resolution of the dispute by arbitration or litigation. So it is important to emphasize the mandatory nature of such a clause since if there is vagueness, it will be difficult to enforce the same. Uh, the parties can name the mediator or choose institutional mediation for which mediation rules have been framed by High Court and Supreme Court where on an application a mediator can be appointed. Uh, the parties can choose the location of mediation with an option to mutually ch uh, change the same in the future. Uh, the provision should provide for confidentiality. The time limit within which mediation should be concluded must also be provided. So, though mediation and conciliation are in practice used interchangeably, as Shukla said, in, uh, but in, a pra in a theory they are very different. So, in the alternative as a pre-arbitral procedure, conciliation can also be provided for in a time-bound manner after mediation. Uh, and However, it should be kept in mind that prolonged negotiation may not only cause delays, uh, but also allow an unscrupulous party to evade its contractual obligations. So for greater clarity in the event of failure of mediation, the next mechanism to be adopted for ADR must be given its own clause. Now coming to an arbitration clause, uh, firstly the words used in the clause should disclose a determination and obligation to go to arbitration and not merely contemplate possibility of going to arbitration in future. So use of the word shall instead of may should be used. Uh, agreement will not be termed as an arbitration agreement uh, if, for example, it requires or permits an authority to decide a claim or dispute without any hearing at all, or if any party is not satisfied, permits filing of civil suit, or requires further or fresh consent of the parties for reference to arbitration. Uh, next, the provision of seat of arbitration is important since it determines the supervisory jurisdiction of courts and the procedural law which governs the arbitration, especially in international arbitration. Seat of arbitration should not be used interchangeably with venue of arbitration. Uh, and it would be better to clearly spell out the same uh, in the clause to avoid ambiguity. Although in some of the judgments of the Supreme Court, uh, they have uh, said that it can be used interchangeably. So even if seat is outside India, the act provides that in international commercial arbitration, subject to an agreement to the contrary, uh, section nine for interim relief, Section 27, Court Assistance and Taking Evidence, and Section 37, Appeal Provisions of the Act, will be applicable. 
Therefore, if parties want to exclude the same, the clause must clearly spell it out. Uh, the party should also specify the number of arbitrators, provided it is not an even number. Uh, they can also specify the qualifications of an arbitrator and in international commercial arbitration, the nationality of arbitrator. Uh, they can agree on a procedure to appoint arbitrator. Alternatively, the parties may specify an arbitral institution to administer the arbitration. Uh, the party should also specify the substantive law governing the arbitration agreement, which may be different to the law governing the contract. Failing designation of applicable law, arbitral tribunals shall apply rules of law it considers appropriate given all circumstances surrounding the dispute. The clause should be broadly worded to cover all disputes, like uh, use of the words arising out of or relating thereto. The parties can expressly bar award of interest pendant daylight. Uh, to avoid costs, the language of the arbitration should also be specified. Uh, there are some issues that a party can either incorporate at the time of drafting arbitration clause or arrive at an agreement after disputes have arisen. So like whether arbitral tribunal can dispense with consideration of the law, but consider solely what they consider to be fair and equitable. Uh, this also facilitates uh, mediation so pro procedure for challenging an arbitrator if circumstances prevail that raise doubt on impartiality and independence of arbitrator procedure to be followed in conduct of proceedings uh, when arbitral proceedings can commence uh, in absence of agreement it commences when a party makes a request to refer disputes to arbitration agree for fast track procedure uh, piece of arbitrator uh, now here i would also add that uh, considering how technology is taking over every aspect of life uh, effectiveness of alternate dispute resolution and technology related disputes also depends on well drafted arbitration clauses, uh, especially due to the unique challenges faced by technology companies on account of global impact of their operations, geographical limitations of a country's legal system, fast paced transfer of data, and maintaining confidentiality on proprietary information. Maintaining confidentiality in a court system may be difficult, further, judges familiar with technology are lacking. So in technology related disputes, tier clauses providing for negotiation by skilled mediators as a prerequisite to arbitration should be provided for. Failing settlement apart from the standard clauses which we discussed, arbitration clauses should also provide for confidentiality clause that prohibits disclosure of any information related to the proceeding. Exceptions may be defined in case any party has to approach court. Uh, arbitration by arbitral institution should be preferred in light of technology disputes being more in the nature of cross-border disputes. Uh, choice of the institution becomes important in such disputes. Uh, those having uh, some institutions have specialized rules for technology related disputes. Uh, they provide for a panel of arbitrators with specific experts. Uh, they have rules to ensure neutrality of arbitrators, etc. Uh, to avoid limited court review, uh, appellate arbitration can also be provided for, and some arbitral institutions provide for such a review. Uh, the technical experts, their appointment procedure, and use can also be specified. Uh, arbitration for arbitrators qualifications may be broadly specified further in a uh, multi-party multi-agreements uh, we have seen that uh, multiple dis uh, res dispute resolution clauses have been signed and this leads to a delay you know in one of our matters this led to a delay of almost 10 to 15 years before an arbitration could commence so therefore in contracts having multiple agreements ADR should be consistent as far as possible Thanks. Uh, thank you, Vanita, for that comprehensive answer. And uh, Shukla, we're, we're running slightly behind time. So um, I think um, what I'd ask you to consider is something that Vanita had said about um, tiered dispute resolution clauses and how they work in practice. Um, what are the kinds of factors that should be considered with having tiered dispute resolution. You and I are, have both been in house counsel. And as I said earlier, companies want to get back into the business of doing their business, not being litigious. And so how do these things work in practice in terms of gradations of ADR? It, it is very much a practical aspect which almost all organizations are adopting today. You know, and it all depends on the nature of the business, the organization, and even the, uh, the size uh, ticket, uh, the size of the dispute that is there. So what normally happens if I break it up, you know, generally you'll have uh, uh, first step would be that the uh, company would, the officers of the company, the executive of the companies would amicably resolve the dispute and there will be a given set amount, number of days, maybe 15 days, 30 days, you know, when the dispute will be resolved. And then 
it, if it doesn't get resolved, then it goes to arbitration or it may go to litigation. Generally, it is always a, if there is a dispute like this, it goes to arbitration by and large. But then if you look into the large organizations like, you know, the, as I mentioned earlier, construction, IT software, and heavy engineering, they, have, they are far more, even they go to the further extent. They have mediation clause will, and that itself has a further tiered approach. Whereas they will define saying that up to $100 million, they will have the, possibly the general managers of, two general managers of one company, another, the other party, two general managers. They will sit together and resolve the dispute. When it goes beyond 100, but below 200 billion dollars, then they will have the vice, <coughs> sorry, the people of the vice president, executive of the vice president level. And then when it goes beyond 200, then it's the chairman. By and large, it is expected because the stakes are very high in these sort of projects. So by and large, it's expected that the dispute will be resolved by following this three-tiered mechanism. And then if it doesn't, then of course it does go to. Uh, uh, mediation it does go to arbitration so broadly this is how the approach is bring so the company looks at the nature of the industry the value the, the the value of the dispute and also corporate culture is very important what is the culture in the organization is it a very litigious com company then they will not give any <clears throat> pay heed to any mediation arbitration they would prefer and uh, so at times there are strategic reasons why they don't do it because they know that delay tactics is a good way to go to court. So broadly, this is how, as an in-house counsel, I would say that this is being done. Paku, we can't hear you. Excuse me. Um, let me turn it back to Vanita. We've talked about different forms of ADR in India. Let's focus on two specific ones, mediation and conciliation. How do they really work today in, in the legal environment and in the cultural and corporate environment in India? Are they really effective tools today? And how do you see that changing over time? Uh, yes, Baku. So firstly, uh, let's look at the legal environment where uh, now th there are many uh, provisions in the Arbitration Act and many changes have been brought about in the CPC as well as the uh, uh, Commercial Courts Act, which promotes mediation. Uh, so under the in the arbitration act uh, there are certain provisions which promote mediation uh, for example section 28.1 provides that an arbitral tribunal if authorized has the power to dispense with consideration of the law and consider solely what they consider to be fair and equitable in the case at hand section 30 provides that it is not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for an arbitral tribunal to encourage settlement of the dispute and with the agreement of the parties the arbitral tribunal may use mediation conciliation or other procedures at any time during the arbitral proceedings to encourage settlement. Uh, it is also provided that the parties can record settlement in the form of an arbitral award, uh, which shall have the same status and effect as any other arbitral award. Uh, the new amendment has brought in a provision by which uh, in determining costs, the tribunal shall also have regard to the fact whether any reasonable offer to settle the dispute is made by a party and refused by the other party. Uh, there is an elaborate conciliation procedure prescribed, provided that parties have not excluded applicability of the same under their agreement, or conciliation is barred by any law for the time being enforced. Uh, settlement agreement arrived at after conciliation also has the status of an award. Uh, also, the commercial courts have, have, have provided an impetus to mediation by providing that where a suit which does not contemplate any immediate interim relief under the act shall not be instituted till the plaintiff exhausts the remedy of pre-institution mediation for which rules have been framed in 2018. Uh, the settlement arrived at under the said mediation has the same status as an arbitral award. Again, in CPC, uh, the government has enacted uh, uh, an amendment where a new uh, section 89 was introduced, uh, which introduces the concept of judicial mediation as opposed to voluntary mediation. Uh, a court can now identify cases where an amicable settlement is possible formulate the terms of such a settlement and invite the observations thereon of the parties to the dispute. Uh, in 2005, Supreme Court Mediation and Conciliation Project Committee has been set up for encouraging amicable settlement of disputes. It has facilitated training in mediation and has also framed rules for mediation. Delhi High Court Mediation Center is actively working for having disputes between parties settled. Many experienced and senior lawyers, among others, act as mediators, which helps in the disputes between the parties to be settled. Uh, another development on 31st July 2019, the Union Cabinet approved the signing of the United Nations Convention on International Settlement Agreements resulting from mediation by the Republic of India. 
uh, Singapore Convention provides a uniform uh, international framework to enforce mediated agreements of cross-border disputes. Now, before this Singapore Convention, a party to a mediated settlement agreement uh, would have to commence an action uh, again through litigation or arbitration to enforce the mediated settlement, unless that was part of a court's order or an arbitral award. So yes, mediation does seem to be looking up in India. Thank you, Vanita. And uh, Shukla, um, with arbitration having been in India for a while and now with Indian arbitration institutes uh, growing, do you see that multinational companies are comfortable in having India as a seat of arbitration in adjudicating their uh, India disputes? Yes, Papu, uh, because uh, you know most of the MNCs that's there have found India a good place to have its own subsidiary. So, so MNCs are setting up subsidiaries in India, which is incorporated in India. So these these subsidiaries are preferring um, arbitration as uh, India as the seat of arbitration. In fact, the organization that I've worked through, they were all subsidiaries of uh, multinationals outside of India, and we've had. If it's Indian to Indian party, it is definitely the seat of arbitration is India. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vanita, um, about enforcement of awards, um, you've mentioned in your earlier presentation about greater ease. Can you expand on that? So, uh, so I'm glad, in fact, that you asked this question since we have already received queries in this regard prior to the webinar. Uh, so there has been a shift towards ease in enforcement one due to the statutory amendments and two due to many pro-arbitration judgments passed in the recent years uh, now after the 2015 amendment there is now no automatic stay of the enforcement of award as i mentioned earlier upon a party filing objections to the award uh, even if a stay is granted the same is subject to conditions protecting the interest of the winning party uh, even under the proposed 2021 amendment uh, where automatic stay of awards is sought to be reintroduced the same is restricted to two situations uh, where the court is satisfied that uh, the relevant arbitration agreement or contract or the making of the award was induced or affected by fraud or corruption. Uh, this change is sought to be made retrospective. Uh, as far as international commercial arbitrations are concerned, the award cannot be challenged on the ground of patent illegality. Uh, foreign awards are enforced in accordance with Part 2 of the Arbitration Act. Uh, Section 48 provides the circumstances when enforcement of a foreign award can be refused, which reflects Article 5 of the New York Convention. Uh, one of the reasons of refusal was if the award was contrary to the public policy of India. This was clarified by the 2015 amendment to specifically mean cases where award is induced by fraud or corruption in contravention with fundamental policy of Indian law and in conflict with the most basic notions of morality and justice. Uh, even though these can also be subject to interpretation. However, some clarity has been brought to a pub, the word public policy. Uh, it has also been clarified that contravention with the fundamental policy of Indian law shall not entail a review on the merits of the dispute. Uh, now, even prior to the amendment, the public policy condition was sought to be narrowed down by various judgments of the Supreme Court. Uh, after 2015 amendment, the application for enforcement of a foreign award now goes directly to the High Court and not to the District Court. Uh, which are located remotely and you know parties could get a stay uh, in 2015 commercial courts have also been constituted in the high courts and district courts to uh, deal with commercial disputes including enforcement of awards to improve efficiency and reduce delays uh, interestingly there's no scope for an appeal against an order of the court for the enforcement of a foreign award the act provides for an appeal only against an order refusing to enforce a foreign award uh, the procedural formality for the court to pronounce judgment and a decree to follow on that basis is omitted. Further, the possibility of the decree being in excess of or not in accordance with the award is also removed. Uh, also now, as per the 2015 amendment, uh, interim awards can also now be enforced as decree of a court. Uh, the issue whether an interim award passed by an emergency arbitrator appointed under SIAC rule is enforceable or not is currently pending consideration in the Supreme Court. Uh, recent pro-arbitration landmark judgments have enforced foreign awards uh, in a very uh, quick uh, turnaround. Uh, in a 2018 pronouncement, uh, in the case of Daichi Sankyo, uh, the High Court refused to uh, intervene in the foreign arbitral award passed in favor of uh, Daichi. It affirmed that an award could not be said to be against the fundamental policy of Indian law in case there was violation of provisions of a statute 
uh, but only there was a breach of a substantial principle on which uh, Indian law is based on. Supreme Court also dismissed an appeal against the High Court order in Limini. Thus, an enforcement order was passed within two years of filing. Uh, thereafter, various High Courts have followed suit and have been loath to refuse uh, enforcement of awards. Uh, another example is the Supreme Court uh, enforced an award worth $278 million passed in favor of Vedanta against the Indian government. The contract was governed by Indian law. Arbitration was seated in Kuala Lumpur and English law applied to arbitration agreement. Uh, importantly, the Supreme Court clarified the limitation period for filing an application to enforce a foreign arbitral award before Indian courts, which was not expressly provided for and there were differing judgments on the issue. So it held that the general three-year limitation period applies to the enforcement of foreign awards. Thanks, Thanks. Rita. And um, just in the interest of time, because we do want to get to our audience questions, I'm going to take the next two questions and, and blur them together. Um, Shukla, we had talked about the long drawn out arbitration procedures. Is that giving rise to other forms of ADR being uh, taken up in India like mediation and um, a conciliation and Vinita on the flip side on arbitration proceedings are they becoming more expeditious and are there ways uh, that you can guide our audience as to make them uh, move quicker so Shukla let me get your thoughts on the mediation and con uh, conciliation and how much they're growing and then Vinita if we can quickly touch on the second point. Baku mediation conciliation, as I said, is growing very much. It, it is there. It's an integral part of every contract today, uh, especially large uh, uh, contracts with high value contracts. You know, there what happens is you may not use the word mediation or conciliation, but definitely that is there. One new one, another subset which is happening is that previously it used to be mediation and conciliation only with the executives of the company. But now third party mediators and accredited mediators are also being sought for, for resolution of dispute. But it, to, to be fair, it is not replacing uh, arbitration. It is it's standing on its own leg. If it succeeds, it's very good. If it doesn't succeed, because this is a facilitated process. And you know, and it is it is sort of negotiated thing. It may succeed, it may not succeed. But more, more often than not, it succeeds. If it doesn't succeed, then the arbitration then comes in. Yeah, Vanita, you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like Shiva said, it's a standalone uh, mediation and arbitration. So, arbitrations, uh, there have been uh, steps taken to expedite. Uh, and it, the first reason being an increased trend by the courts to reduce judicial intervention. So, we have seen that trend. And certain provisions under the Arbitration Act, uh, either existing prior to the amendments or brought in after the amendments, also now facilitate expeditious arbitration. So even prior to amendment, Section 5 provided that no judicial authority shall intervene except where provided under the Act. Uh, Section 8 in domestic arbitrations and Section 45 in international commercial arbitrations, they provided that a court before whom a judicial proceeding is filed in a dispute referable to arbitration. Uh, and if a party makes an application that refer the dispute to arbitration, uh, the judicial authority shall do so. Uh, only, uh, but unless it finds prima facie that no valid arbitration agreement exists. Now, prior to the 2015 amendment, the power was wide, and now it has been limited to only examine whether there is a valid arbitration agreement. Uh, then, uh, 2015 amendment also under Section 11 provides for a time-bound appointment of arbitral tribunal. Again, the powers of the courts to examine other issues while dealing with appointment of uh, tribunal that has also been taken away. Uh, 2015 amendment again limited it to examining the validity or existence of arbitration agreement that under the 2000 amendment, if this residual power has also been taken away, uh, then even under section nine, suppose if a, for uh, appli where application can be filed for an interim relief, uh, if an arbitral tribunal has already been constituted, the courts do not interfere and send the parties back to the arbitral tribunal to apply for interim relief. Uh, so then under the 2015 amendment, a man mandate of an arbitrator, it is also provided that it can be terminated if he fails to act without undue delay. Uh, then an arbitrator also, this, this, this is also by way of the amendment that they have to file disclosure stating number of ongoing arbitrations for certain if they can devote the time. Uh, and the courts while appointing arbitrator also keep such disclosures in mind. Uh, to, to incentivize arbitrators, it is also provided that if an award is made within six months, an arbitrator is entitled to additional fees that the parties may agree. Uh, then even uh, 
uh, where applications are filed challenging the uh, independence of arbitrator and if the parties uh, lose the arbitration still goes on and the parties can then choose to challenge the same while filing objections to the award uh, the time bound completion of pleadings is provided for and consequences to that are provided a uh, new introduction this regime of costs has been uh, brought in uh, where uh, arbitrator while imposing costs will look into circumstances like conduct of parties uh, parties filing a frivolous counterclaim and also whether a reasonable offer to settle has been refused uh, there's a time limit to passing of the awards as well uh, in 2019 this was restricted to domestic awards however uh, fast track procedure is provided for uh, objections to the award are restricted to certain grounds uh, there's a limitation period prescribed within which objections can be filed and beyond a certain period delay cannot be condoned uh, also it has also now been prescribed after the 2015 amendment that prior notice has to be given to the opposite party and such an application has to be disposed of in a year uh, then again appeal provisions also are very restricted uh, the appeal uh, there's no second appeal the appeal lies straight to the supreme court uh, commercial courts have expedited uh, disposal uh, of appeals and uh, certain orders uh, also virtual hearings have really caught up in arbitrations and that has really reduced during the time during the time of pandemic there is reduced delay uh, another important development by the courts uh, the uh, 2019 amendment sought to give a prospective effect to the 2015 amendment act because 2015 amendment brought in the provision that there will be no automatic stay so prospective effect would have meant uh, uh, petition arbitration petitions pending prior to 2015 they would have been an automatic stay now uh, the court uh, struck down this provision uh, as unconstitutional recently uh, then uh, and what more can be done i think that apart from a well drafted arbitration clause as we discussed uh, to prevent contentious issues uh, i think it requires a, a collective effort from arbitrators and the parties themselves to uh, stick to time limit limit the production and discovery of documents to the most essential and limiting uh, filing out of context or irrelevant, irrelevant motions. This arbitration process should be avoided becoming too much like litigation. Uh, and after also arbitrators while drafting awards should be, you know, should they should give importance to reasoning and reduce areas where award can be challenged. So here training of arbitrators may be useful. All right, thank you, Vinita. Thank you, Shikla. I think very last question, and we are running a short of time because we want to get to our audience questions in 30 seconds or less and i'm going to hold you both to that what is the one thing that you want our audience to remember if they remember nothing else shikwa you first benita you second and then we'll go to the questions okay adr is there to stay so and the adr via the online dispute resolution is the way to go in future this should help in expediting the dispute resolution be it through mediation or arbitration and it will help expeditiously and fairly economically as well. Thanks, Vanita. Um, I would say where there's a will, there's an expeditious arbitration. <laughs> very, very precise and to the point. So listen, uh, thank you both for uh, those practical tips and, and also the very specific uh, guidance on, on ADR in India. Uh, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, uh, please use your question. Uh, button to type in any questions. And for those of you watching the recording, we put an email address, events at kethanco.com. It's on your screen there in blue. Um, and you can email us questions if you're watching the recording of this. Um, let's go to the first question we had, which is, uh, can you throw some light on the appointment of a sole arbitrator by banks and financial institutions with reference to the Apex Court and various high court findings? I'll take that, Paku. Um, now, so uh, the banks and financial institutions, they, the loan agreements, they used to have uh, the uh, clause that uh, the uh, sole arbitrator can be appointed by the banks. Now, by virtue of a Supreme Court judgment, uh, Perkins case, unilateral appointments have been done away with. Uh, it has been held that the uh, efficacy of arbitration as an alternate dispute resolution mechanism rests on the foundation that the disputes would be adjudicated by independent and impartial arbitrators so a sole arbitrator can be appointed but with the consent of the parties or uh, by the supreme court or high court as the case may be 
Uh, now, however, uh, if an agreement provides for the uh, appointment of an arbitral tribunal out of a panel of uh, serving or retired officers, there it has been held that the procedure as agreed by the parties ought to be followed, since in such a case the procedure takes into account the option of the other party as well. But yes, the sole appointment, uh, sole, uh, you know, what banks the earlier the uh, the power that they had to appoint a sole arbitrator that has been done away with. Okay, thanks, Vinita. I think we'll have time for a couple more questions. Uh, uh, Shukla, um, any sectors or industries um, witnessing more ADR uh, as opposed to judicial litigation um, in India? And are Sorry. there other? Did you just repeat the question? Sure. Are there any sectors or industries that see more use of ADR methods as a means of dispute resolution? compared to other sectors and are there more uh, are certain types of disputes that are more frequently uh, arbitrated yeah as i said earlier the large turnkey project companies companies dealing with uh, belonging to the heavy industry engineering industry construction industry it and as well as software companies they are definitely uh, used adr extensively as a method of proof. Other organizations have been using it because they understand that litigation nobody wants to go to. So as a first step, they have also been adopting ADR as uh, the first step to its resolution. Okay, thank you, Shaklan. Um, I think we only have time for one more um, question. Um, how has COVID, uh, Vanita, affected uh, arbitration and other forms of dispute resolution? And just very quickly, because we are, really are running short of time, what are some of those reasons for those effects? So yes, uh, COVID uh, did impact arbitration like it did everything else. But uh, in fact, I would say that it has helped show a way to uh, expedite arbitration. Uh, after initial hiccups, the dispute resolution mechanism has uh, become technology driven. Uh, with virtual hearings and e-filings becoming the norm. Uh, so this will further tip the scales, in fact, uh, towards online dispute resolution. So the procedural timelines in India were relaxed so as to prevent miscarriage of justice to a party for not being able to approach the relevant forum due to the pandemic. However, uh, now uh, in objections filed several months after lockdown was over, leniency is not being shown. Uh, judiciary also was at the forefront of providing justice to the parties during, and you know very quickly they adapted to the virtual mode and uh, many orders were passed uh, in arbitration matters. Okay, Vinita, thank you and thank you, Shakwa. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of our program and um, I think it's very clear from what uh, both Vinita and Shakwa said, ADR and ODR, online dispute resolution, is something that is clearly here to stay. And I think, um, you know, with India's um, uh, total focus on ease of doing business, this slots right in um, as one of the key ways that uh, India is focusing on, on the ease of doing business. I'd like to thank uh, three groups of people. First of all, Shukla, thank you so much um, for joining us. And um, I think Vinita and uh, myself on behalf of Ketan and Co would thank you as well as uh, the USIBC and the South Asian Bar Association for their sponsorship. And most of all, uh, you, the audience, thanks so much for joining us and we'll try to send you some information shortly after the program. Uh, stay safe and healthy and let me turn it over to Amy to close the program. Thanks, Paku, and thank you everyone for joining. I wanna echo your comments and thanking Shukla and Vinita for joining us as we approach International Women's Day in a week. We have two really excellent preeminent women in their legal fields. And so we're very lucky to be joined by both of you. Thank you. Um, I especially want to thank uh, Ketan and company for hosting this webinar as India's oldest law firm, I think over 100 years old, I'm not going to get the exact number right, but um, has been around uh, for a long, long time in India, and not just one of the oldest or the oldest law firm in India, also one of the preeminent and top tier law firms. Uh, we're so glad to have their support and partnership. Uh, with the US India Business Council. And Paku, to you in particular, as you lead the US work uh, here for Ketan and help support that in your own in-house council experience, I'm sure you have some thoughts on this as well. We're grateful for your support. So thank you to everyone. And I wanna echo uh, the South Asian Bar Association of DC, 
Thank you for your support. Again, this will be recorded. So if you wanna rewatch or absorb any of the really fantastic information um, that was said today, we'll send out the recording link and post it up on social media. But wish everyone uh, a very healthy uh, rest of the year and day. And thank you again for joining. Good evening to those of you joining from India and a good rest of the day from the United States. Bye-bye. Take care. Stay safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.